Today we are going to be talking about a piece of music that represents the sacrifice of a young maiden to the gods. I know this scenario seems like just another Monday, but this piece is truly remarkable and unsettling, or beautiful depending how you look at it. Anyways, let's get into the analysis. Part 1. Adoration of the Earth Introduction The Rite of Spring begins with the famous bassoon solo. The bassoon is pushed to its limits here, playing in its upper tenor range. It is then joined by several other instruments as the solo develops and alternating time signature stretch and squish phrases. This alternation of meter is going to be a theme throughout this piece. It is only until the clarinets come in that things begin to feel off. The bassoon trails off and everything slowly devolves into natural chaos. The overall lack of pulse in this section of the piece is meant to represent nature itself and the unthawing process that is spring. An English horn solo opens up as things begin begin to melt, with an oboe doing an excellent job at replicating a bird, and bass clarinets replicate the sound of frogs. To some, this may sound creepy, unearthly, and unnatural, but it is exactly the opposite to others, who see it as the savage beauty of the earth waking up from the winter. The piccolo clarinet in particular raises an eyebrow, as most people never hear a clarinet playing so high with such an effortless sounding quality. Quality. It resembles some sort of crude ancient tribal instrument. Rhythmic tuplets overlap as the earth is slowly filled with the lifeblood and warms up to spring. With the reintroduction of the bassoon solo and pizzicato violins, we are brought into the next section. Overall, the introduction serves as, well, a great introduction to the piece. It immediately shows the audience that the Rite of Spring is not your typical ballet music, and that you are about to be bombarded by crazy harmonies and rhythms. It also sets up the piece as having the capacity to be stunning and magnificent, from a more traditional point of view, perhaps, if you have a more open viewpoint. Augurs of Spring now the piece begins in earnest, and it certainly catches your attention, immediately going to these double stop polychords. The polychord in question is E flat 7 over F flat, played by double stop strings and accented by horns on seemingly random beats. These chords are interspersed by a more pleasant harmony being outlined by the English horn, bassoons, and pizzicato cellos going up and down. We then hear the first use of this evil trumpet motif, which is echoed in several different instruments, not just the trumpet. The section expands as more instruments, mainly flutes and trumpets, take the forefront with grand gestures like runs and big staccato chords. After that, the bassoons take on the evil trumpet motif, this time making it sound a lot more kind and predictable instead of ear shattering. A trombone helps out the bassoons here too. Stravinsky begins to experiment more and more by adding the oboes and flutes playing these complementary grace note figures to the bassoon soli line. Before, a large brass chord interrupts the flow of things and leads to a very expressive bar with flute, trumpet, trombone, and strings. After this point, the augurs of spring begins to open up, straying away from the polychords and evil trumpet lines mostly, and following more closely to the story of a world waking up again. The first instance of a new melody is heard in the trumpets, in front of the beautiful chaos being presented by the rest of the orchestra. which is cut short by a tight section mostly composed of strings and clarinets before once again the piece opens up into something disturbing yet strangely alluring and then it all crashes down into the next section. The Augurs of Spring builds upon the intro on how chaos can be both unsettling and amazing, particularly when the section breaks away from that E flat 7 over F flat polychord, things really begin to feel more alive and natural.
Rituals of Abduction. We're not even seven minutes into the piece here, and there must have already been at least a dozen mood changes. This is one of the more interesting ones here because it contrasts a dark, brassy chord beneath to an almost happy sounding line being played by flutes and trumpets above. But of course, this is the Rituals of Abduction, so things aren't quite going to be happy. This section of the Rite of Spring revolves around a back and forth between brass and woodwinds, representing the back and forth between hunter and prey. The timpani behind it all keeps the pulse unsteady and offbeat. You can really hear the fear in the woodwinds and the brass's savage persistence here, but the harmony often tells otherwise, making it sound more like a demented game than an actual hunt, which it actually is in the actual ballet. The timpani plays against the woodwinds after afterwards, with the player giving one strike between the winds playing the opening motif of the section with the trumpet behind them. This is immediately followed by tremolo strings, interrupted by these overarching tutti chords, which foreshadow the climax of the next section, before everything comes down to a grinding halt. In the ballet, the rituals of abduction represents the young maidens being abducted by the men of the tribe to be used as sacrifices, or at least one of them. But guys, it's just a game. The section of music here seems to be trying to signify this unsettling fact, but is cut short before things go too far. Spring rounds. Flute trills underline the first part of this section, with piccolo clarinet and bass clarinet playing together, two whole octaves apart. This amazing melody that consistently shifts time signatures. 4-4 four, four is then reached as the bassoon's bass drum and lower strings hit the downbeat together, with an alternating syncopated harmony immediately following, which, knowing Stravinsky, who can't let any one one idea sit by itself for a while is interrupted by a callback to the beginning of the section. Just no trills and more direct harmony. Repeat this section with some variation and then we have the horns playing the chords now. After four solo violas take over for the horns, they turn it into a melody. Specifically, the melody from Augurs of Spring, when things began to open up for the first time. The violas are doubled by the flutes in order to project their melody more, as solo string instruments aren't the loudest. An ominous piccolo trill follows, casting a light shadow over the melody. The section then goes to its original configuration of instrument and rolls for a few bars. If you have heard this piece before, this is where you would normally start holding your breath and perhaps turning down your volume. Because remember kids, in these modern 20th century works, it is often the quietest, most logical section of music that devolves into the most horrifying abominations of musical genius. The melody from before is blown up into the better part of the orchestra, now harmonized in a terrifying way. But that's not the scariest part here, which goes, undoubtedly, to the unexpected trombone slide that in certain recordings absolutely destroy your eardrums. As the melody slowly begins to melt into a furious magma, it also begins to slow down until reaching its end. Or did it? The flute section tells us that we aren't off that easily and signals the coming of more destructive and beautiful chaos. Musical excerpts like these tell us that the rite of spring is an acquired taste for many. The calm beginning of spring rounds is then repeated almost identically, just with slightly different instrumentation. The first time I listened to this part, I was like, this is really nice, it finally makes sense now. It's in 4-4 four, four and has things I can understand. But well, that didn't last for long. And by the time the calm beginning returned, I didn't know what to think of spring rounds or the rite of spring in general. It was just that disturbing. 
The peace and tranquility from the end of spring rounds hits reality in this section, as the listener's ear is bombarded with tritones and weird rhythms. Much like rituals of abduction, this section is a continuous conversation between several parties, in this case low brass and timpani against horns, against winds and trumpets. Lots of polychords and interesting harmony is present here that must have been a headache for Stravinsky to figure out, and of course the ever-changing time signature. One thing to note, and that is oboes and clarinets can sound absolutely terrifying together, as seen with this creepy doll-like melody at the start of this section, which is developed in the flutes and trumpets. This part has plenty of different ideas going against each other, just this one melody really stood out, especially with the muted trumpets. The section gets even stompier with the lower strings hitting this repeated motif and the upper voices of the orchestra arguing with the horns. That is, until they begin to work together in a beautiful unison. But of course, this is short-lived as the Rite of Spring is a little Timmy who has a severe case of ADHD and can't focus on one thing too long. Overall, this section of the Rite of Spring does sound very ritualistic and very much like a mock war that it is trying to represent. It is one of the more dissonant sections of this piece, but by this point, the listener is starting to get used to that, so the overall effect is perhaps beginning to diminish a little, dare I say. Procession of the Sage this section is relatively short, but very distinct. It is a conversation between the tubas, of which there are four total. Two tenor tubas and two bass tubas, and them having a conversation with the horns. They keep yelling over each other, as a steady rhythm outlining some sort of dissonant harmony pulses beneath it all. The main development for this section is in the Pushin, which slowly expands into something terrifyingly huge. This is mainly signified by the guiro, a less common orchestral instrument with the sound of a grave being hastily dug, joining the ensemble with vigor and force. The section then ends suddenly, with no warnings, into silence, with only a short section titled The Sage to end it off. Very to the point this section is. It is rather dark and moody sounding, but at least it gives the percussion some spotlight. Also, it is funny that the procession of the sage is a huge undertaking for basically the whole orchestra, but the section titled The Sage, which comes right after, is extremely short and relatively simple. Dance of the Earth. Dance of the Earth begins with a bass drum roll. The beginning of the section section sounds super happy and excited, even despite some of the clashing harmonies. This is mainly due to the hyperactive runs and rhythms being played here, as well as the huge fanfare like chords and melody. A slow buildup commences, with different sporadic rhythms playing alongside each other, not mixing well but neither attacking each other. Violins go higher as the buildup gets more aggressive, large brassy chords and woodwind runs join the section again, but more sudden and less pronounced. And all that built up to is the next part of the piece. The Dance of the Earth starts as a large, triumphant fanfare, but dies down rather quickly before building up to the next part of the Rite of Spring, called The Sacrifice. A little anticlimactic, perhaps, but after you hear the introduction of The Sacrifice, you will be glad there was at least some happiness and excitement. Part 2. The Sacrifice Introduction Unsettling and alternating woodwind chords with horns acting as a bed of fear. This is how the second and final section of the Rite of Spring begins. Sounds kind of like Star Wars, especially with the string harmonics that come in every few bars, accenting the harmonies and disrupting the rhythms. And of course, the overarching titanic and terrifying chords that burst out every few bars. These these chords give me nightmares.
a few melodic fragments in the violins are thrown in here too, which will become important not only for the introduction, but the rest of the sacrifice as well. This is immediately taken into effect with a solo violin playing unbelievably high and unbelievably delicate harmonic notes that echo these melodic fragments. The alto flute is supporting it many octaves below, while some of the other strings and woodwinds are still playing those alternating chords and rhythms. The string writing in this part is very 20th century, being incredibly precise and delicate with tons of divisi and soli divisi. The trumpet writing is also incredibly delicate, with two trumpets playing this empty, lost and distant figure in alternation with each other. The strings clearly don't care about how the trumpets feel, as they seem to be actively trying to ruin their moment with Halstein dark chords. A quick run brings us back into the realm of harmonics and unpredictable rhythms. The clarinets are playing the lost trumpet motif from earlier here, but often get absorbed by the chaos around them. This is before the horns take the harmonic violin melody in a harmonized chorale, and then without much of a pause, the horns then keep their solely with now the lost trumpet motif, with low strings and bass clarinet backing them up. That was a long sentence, man. My English teacher would start spanking me. This then perfectly transitions into the next section. The introduction to the sacrifice is the longest section in the entire piece, mainly due to its slow nature. That slow speed doesn't stop it from being incredibly complex, utilizing many different techniques across multiple instruments, and I still shudder thinking about those titanic chords from the start. Mystic Circles of the Young Girls, a six violin soli, takes the old harmonic melody now in their upper mid range and as a large chorale that sounds so delicate even with the ever growing accompaniment. But wait, the tempo suddenly increases and the mood of the piece begins to swell into a folk like happiness again. Perhaps slightly demented, but not as terrifying as what was happening before, at least. But not quite. As things slow down again, with a persistent rhythm and interesting melodies and harmonies playing overhead. Some motives are new here, but others are from the introduction of this part of the piece, the sacrifice. That rhythm now leaves our ears as we now focus solely on the melody at hand, the same violin harmonic one from the introduction, which trades off between several instrument families in strings, winds, and brass. This is before chaos inevitably takes over and the old stompiness from part one, Adoration of the Earth, comes back. This section is a lot like the introduction to the sacrifice, just more chill and less disturbing. Glorification of the Chosen One. Plenty of time changes here. This creates a disruptive and monstrous conversation, rather argument, between the flutes and horns, with the rest of the orchestra joining in for certain moments in each bar. A demented march sits between the different variations of the main theme of this section, hearkening back to the last 13 beats of Mystic Circles of the Young Girls, which were particularly stompy. Once again, my English teacher would not be happy with that sentence. Just when it seems things can't get any more horrifying, a new idea emerges. This idea involves quick runs up and down from most of the orchestra with the piccolo trumpet playing an unmeasured tremolo beneath it all. After that, the horns and trumpets blare out dissonant chords with the winds and strings playing disfigured rhythms and harmonies against it. Then, the timpani player gets a chance to really shine with a whole bunch of eighth notes tied together through changing meters. This provides a steady pulse even when the time signature changes to clear otherwise. When the rest of the orchestra joins back in, in earnest, the trumpets take the lead every couple or so bars with a motif similar to the old evil trumpet motif from the augers of spring. The section makes a quick change in pace as it slowly begins to end, that sentence made sense, with a return to the beginning theme of this section. It gets ready to move on to the next section. 
This is a very recognizable part from the Rite of Spring here. We've got crazy runs and dissonant chords paired with constant meter changes and a lot of powerful dynamics like fortissimo and fortississimo. When someone thinks of the Rite of Spring, th this section may be what pops up in their head. It is representative of the piece as a whole that much. Evocation of the Ancestors. Strong bass line, big loud chords, sounding triumphant and terrifying at the same time. That's pretty much it. Nah, just kidding. There is a bit more nuance here. Timpani and bass drum rolls, quieter repeats of the fanfare, development of the main fanfare, and a beautiful bassoon solely towards the end of this section. One last bright chordal explosion leads us nicely to the next section. The ancestors indeed sound very evocative here. Ritual action of the ancestors. We begin with perhaps the last part of the piece that can be truly considered chill. Bass drum trades off with tambourine and timpani, setting a consistent rhythm for this part of the section. An English horn takes the lead here, with a more chromatic solo with long held notes. The alto flute joins in in providing some counterpoint to the English horn line, with the clarinet ending things off. This is before before the alto flute picks things up again with a bassoon and a muted string rhythm behind it all. And prepare for the weirdest trumpet sound you will ever hear. Three muted trumpets playing in three octaves, but the lowest one is actually a bass trumpet playing in its lower register, giving it a very smoker type of sound. They then leave the scene, making room for tremolo strings to spice things up a bit more, with the alto flute line being double an octave above by the regular flute. As things are starting to get a bit more dense and the alto flute can only play so loudly. This is before everything comes crashing down as the bass trumpet melody from earlier comes in at full force in the horns with harmonization from the rest of the orchestra but mainly the trumpets. That quickly ends with low brass hits followed by chromatic wind runs with the strings supporting the overall structure and then the horns come back again in full force. Nothing like A4 for TCCMO horns blasting in your ears on a nice Monday morning. After that, the bass trumpet plays the old English horn melody from before. A very good fit for the instrument with the English horn itself providing the sustained notes with an unusually good dovetailing with the bass trumpet. The alto flute comes back again just afterwards. And then when the second clarinet joins in, it now has a much more significant role with the other clarinets, of course, doing trills and tremolos and other fun stuff. An excellent section indeed, with a lot of chill moments, but also completely unhinged parts, especially with those evil sounding French horns. The ancestors are clearly not to be trusted here. But next, we move on to perhaps the most evil and terrifying section of the piece, and the last section of this piece, the sacrificial dance. Sacrificial Dance. The beginning and main theme of this section is meant to represent the young maiden who has been chosen by her ancestors as the sacrifice to dance herself to death with uncomfortable and pain-jerking motions. Stravinsky achieves this with ever-changing time signatures, mostly with a beat length of an 8th or 16th. Plenty of double stops in the strings are used as well to highlight the disturbing chords. And when the brass comes in full force, there is no going back. Bassoons, horns, and strings quiet things down with a hesitant sounding rhythm. Once again, a rhythm that cannot be predicted or ignored. And we once again get the evil trumpet motif, at first in the trombone, but taken up by the trumpet shortly after. The strings exclusively take the role of the harmony and rhythm now, playing that at sempre sf, meaning all Always suddenly loud, and with plenty of double stops to strengthen the chords even more. The evil trumpet motif makes several returns here, with the piccolo clarinet and piccolo flutes helping out. This is before the rhythm is taken up by the whole of the wind section and the horns, with the heavy brass taking a short break. More repeats of old material, with the rhythmic section getting a partial repeat, followed by the main theme of the sacrificial dance. But we're only halfway through this. 
this man. More chaos emerges in the percussion and in the brass. Nothing even makes sense anymore. The instruments sound like puppets being controlled by the devil himself. Sounds very nice. If you're insane. The opening makes a brief return again, followed by more disturbing chaos, which I can't really describe. The rhythm and main theme of the section combine together into one and actually fit very well together, with the timpani truly keeping us on our toes with its offbeat heartbeats. The main theme becomes unrecognizable as it develops into even more of a monster, seeming to get a little tired and more strained before. Gasping for air, gasping for life. A poco a crescendo, meaning a little faster over time, marks the last few bars of this piece, followed by one last short tutti chord, a flute run, a piccolo run, and string run, then a hit on the horns, low brass, and low strings. Dead. Oh wait. DEAD! The sacrificial dance definitely deserved to go down in history as one of the most unhinged musical sections ever composed. No wonder Stravinsky was so full of himself. He was that good. Well, that sufficiently traumatized me. What about you? Please leave your thoughts in the comments about this beast of a work. And if you perhaps want to learn about a more tonal part of 20th century music, click on this video here, which is about the famous choral section Section from Jupiter by Gustav Holst, composed only four years after the Rite of Spring. All right, I'm going to therapy now. That I, I am composing the Sacred Printemps, and I cite Igor Stravinsky.